Welcome um, everyone. Uh, my name's Erin uh, Johnson. I work at Sydney Microscopy and Microanalysis and um, I'm part of the Volume Imaging Australia Committee um, where I focus on electron microscopy. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome you today to our next um, well, the, the last um, Volume Imaging Australia webinar for the year, we've had a great series so far focusing on different types of um, or approaches of uh, to image analysis. And we're going to um, finish it off with a bang, a double header, um, looking at um, denoising um, strategies with deep learning. Um, so we've got two great talks uh, lined up for you today. Um, hosted in conjunction with Microscopy Australia, I should mention. Um, so first, we're going to be hearing from Ben Salmon, uh, who is a PhD student in the group of Alex Krull at the University of Birmingham. And though he's not visiting Australia, he's actually giving uh, his talk <laughs> from the UK at 5am in the morning. So um, thank you very much, Ben, um, for the early start. Um, and he's going to talk about the work he's doing um, developing these strategies. Uh, and then we're going to hear from um, Chad Moore, who is a multimodal microscopist here at Sydney Microscopy and Microanalysis, who has been applying these approach approaches and trying out and uh, testing um, different uh, different aspects of them um, and how they work for our data here. Over to you, Ben. Thanks, Erin. Uh, so yeah, I'm Ben uh, from the University of Birmingham, and I'm going to be walking through some of the latest or most key developments in deep learning for denoising in volume microscopy. And then, as Aaron said, later on, Chad will demonstrate some of these approaches on real electron microscopy data. So microscopists are often faced with a trade-off, image quality versus sample damage. Using high photon or electron doses can give us crisp, clean images, but will often damage the samples. Low photon or electron doses can preserve the sample, but will often result in noisy images. Uh, sometimes experimental constraints force us to work with low electron or photon doses, and we have to deal with noise in a post-processing step known as denoising. Um, before the advent of deep learning, most denoisers, classical denoisers such as BM3D, had no understanding of the structures that they were trying to recover. So this would lead to strange artifacts or blurring in the denoised images. Today, deep neural networks or DNNs can be trained to understand the structures that they're trying to recover and can produce denoised images with no artifacts and with sharp, clear details. The evolution of deep learning for denoising started in 2018 with content-aware image restoration, or CARE. CARE is, to this day, one of the most powerful deep learning approaches for denoising and can handle any noise type. But as Chad will explain later, it requires paired training data that's matched pairs of noisy and clean images, which can be quite difficult to obtain in practice. Here's an overview of how you might go about collecting training data for care. You would prepare your sample and then image it once using low light to produce a noisy image. And then keeping the sample perfectly fixed and without moving, increase the amount of light and take a brighter image that would be our clean, clear ground truth. And then you move the sample and repeat this process over and over again to build up a paired data set of matched noisy and ground truth images. To train a network to denoise, we can then use these images by first feeding a noisy image into the network. And that will apply some function to the image and produce some image as output. Um, at the start of training, the network doesn't really know what we want it to do. It just knows that it's been passed an image. We teach it to denoise by comparing its output 
to the known target ground truth image with something called a loss function. And the loss function is essentially a measure of how different these two images are, the output and the target. Um, and this information can be backpropagated to the network, causing it to adjust its internal parameters such that next time when we show it a different new noisy image, it will produce an output that's slightly closer to the target and score a lower loss function. And then we repeat this process over and over and again until the network, well, as the network then for gets closer and closer to matching the target with its output, effectively learning to denoise. Um, and with enough practice, the network can take an image that it's never seen before as input, one that we don't have a clean ground truth target for, and produce a denoised image as output. So the main strength of care is the fact that it can just kind of handle any noise type, any issue. If as long as you have those paired images, then it can learn to go from one to the other. The limitations of care are the fact that it's not always possible to capture the clean target image. Often the biological sample is too delicate or too sensitive such that even one clean image is out of the question. It's also a challenge to register the noisy and clean images together because can, it's not allowed to be any shifting of one image relative to the other. And if there's a live moving sample, then that must be fixed between exposures. So the first of these limitations led researchers to ask, do we actually need clean images to train a denoiser? One response to this question came from the developers of Noise to Noise. And they made the surprising observation that clean targets are not necessary. Actually, with enough training data, noisy targets can work just as well. That means our training data collection process for noise to noise starts off the same as care, where we capture a low signal to noise ratio image while sample. And then keeping the sample fixed and keeping the brightness low, we would capture another image of the same area to cap to get a pair of noisy images with the same underlying clean signal, but different random samples of noise on top. And then repeat this process over the sample, different areas, different samples to build up a training data set of paired noisy images. So the key insight here is that the noisy images can be thought of as the sum of an underlying ground truth, which is exactly the same from noisy image one to noisy image two. But on top of that, there's random and completely different samples of noise. So how does this work? Well, we can now repeat the same training process as with care, but using noisy images as target instead of clean images. So we feed an image into the network, it produces some images output. We compare that output to the target using the loss function and back propagate it to the network. And the network will try to more and more closely match the target. And uh, some of you might have different intuition about what will happen by training like this. You might think that since we're using noisy images as target, the network will learn to produce noisy images as output. But we have to remember a key characteristic of noise, and that's its randomness, which makes it unpredictable. So given one noisy image as input, given this one noisy image as input, this the noise in the target image is totally unpredictable. The network has no idea what noise might be in, actual noise values might be in this target image. But the one feature that it can consistently get right every time is the underlying real biological structures, which are perfectly consistent from input to target image. This means that this training process has the exact same effect as care in that the network will learn to denoise images as its output since it can't reconstruct the noise in the target. Um, so this method is very powerful. Um, actually with enough training data can produce results as good as care. It also has another advantage in that since we never actually have to collect high signal to noise ratio images, we never have to shine a bright light on the sample. The training data 
can be the very images that you intend to actually denoise and study. You just have to take two images of everything. The limitations of care are the same, well, one of the same one, uh, limitation of noise to noise is one of the same as with care in that registering the two images on top of each other is very difficult and moving samples is still a massive issue. So this led researchers to ask, do we actually need paired images to train a denoiser? And one response to that question came from noise to void. And they made the observation that in some circumstances, target images for the network can be produced from the input images. So that means that the training collection process for noise to void, you simply image everything once using low brightness and build up a data set of unpaired individual noisy images. And the key insight here is that noise is sometimes spatially uncorrelated. What do we mean by that? So the noise, noisy image can be thought of as the sum of an underlying ground truth signal and independent noise. So the noise that's generated in one pixel is completely independent of the noise that's generated in other pixels and in other pixels and so on. Here I'm showing individual pixels as large patches just because visualization on the slideshow. Um, so what that means is the noise in one location, the actual value of the noise in one location tells us absolutely nothing about the value of the noise in another location. In the same way that with noise to noise, the noise in one image tells us nothing about the noise in another image. Here we exploit the fact that sometimes the noise in one pixel tells us nothing about the noise in other pixels. So that means we can build up a training data set of input and target images by randomly selecting pixels from the image. Here again, it's large boxes, but these represent individual pixels. We randomly select individual pixels, take them out of the input image and set them as target. And then the input to the network is this noisy image with pixels removed. And we ask the network to predict those missing pixels as target. And again, backpropagate follow the same process as before. The effect this has is the same as noise to noise, where the noise in the target pixels is totally unpredictable from the noise in the remaining pixels, but the underlying biological structure is very predictable. We can know if we're looking at a signal here and we're kind of in a bright orange region, then the pixel to the side is obviously most likely going to be very bright as well. So this has the effect of if the same process is applied to every pixel in the image, where the network is kind of guessing at missing values, it will just learn to produce a denoised image as its best guess as the target. And um, so, yeah, this is now very powerful because we only have to image our samples once to train noise to void. We can image moving things. We don't have to register images. We also have the same advantage as noise to noise, where the training data can be the images that we would like to have denoised. But some limitations of noise to void remain. One of those is the fact that by removing pixels from the image, the network learns to ignore the value of a pixel when predicting its denoised output. This is sacrificing a lot of information. And another issue is that sometimes our assumption about the independence of pixels is incorrect. Often in many imaging modalities, predicting scanning based modalities, the noise can be correlated from one pixel to the next. Um, so to illustrate that more clearly, here I have a very noisy image from a uh, confocal scanning microscopy. Um, if you look closely, you might be able to see some streaking in the noise in the scanning direction. And to make that clearer, what I've done here is on the x-axis plotted the noise in each pixel, the intensity of the noise on the x-axis, and then gone one pixel to the right and plotted the intensity of the noise in the horizontally adjacent pixel 
on the y-axis. And what this reveals is there's a negative correlation from one pixel to the next in the scanning direction, in the noise that is. If we go against the scanning direction and plot the value of the noise in each pixel against the value of the noise in its vertically adjacent neighbor, we see there's almost no correlation. Um, these structures prohibit the use of noise to avoid because if we remove a pixel, noise to avoid can guess somewhat at the value of the noise in that removed pixel from the value of the noise in the horizontally adjacent pixel. So that led to the development of correlated and signal dependent denoising or COSD. This is my project that I've been working on. Um, and this uh, method also requires only single unpaired noisy images to be trained and can handle spatially correlated noise when the correlations are in a row or vertical column direction. Um, so the training process for this is a bit different from the one methods we've seen previously. Instead of just predicting a target image from an input image, caused is trained to encode an image into a compressed representation and then decode that image into a reconstruction of the original input. And these two encoder and decoders are also deep neural networks with parameters that are trained in the same way. Um, and this process can be thought of as similar to JPEG compression, where in JPEG compression, we strip information out of an image to try to compress its file size, but keep visual changes to a minimum. Here with COSD, the network, these two networks are specifically designed such that as the network, as the encoder creates the compressed image, it removes anything that's just correlated horizontally. And it's able to do this because the decoder has the power to recover information that's correlated horizontally. So that effect, uh, we then yeah, repeat the process before the loss function here um, is the difference between the reconstructed image and the input image, and plus a loss that tells us how well we've compressed the image. So as this process repeats, the encoder learns to strip horizontally correlated information out of the input and the decoder learns to put it back in. And that means the encoder learns to produce compressed images that are representations of uh, denoised images. So once we've done that, once we've finished training this encoder and decoder, we can feed a noisy image into the encoder, get a compressed image that only describes the underlying signal ground truth content, and then train a new decoder that takes this compressed image as input, cannot recover horizontal correlations, unlike the decoder before, and will try to reconstruct the original input. Since this compressed image doesn't contain any information about the noise in the input, and this decoder cannot recover the noise, its best guess at reconstructing the original input is just a denoised image. And that gives us our complete denoiser. So, caused uh, key strengths again, training images can be, since we only have to collect things once, can be the images that we would like to in the end denoise. Um, and we can now handle a very common case of spatially correlated noise where we have these correlations in a row or column direction. Limitations of cause though are that it's a much slower training process than the previous method. It takes many hours more to train. And it also consumes a lot more GPU memory than the other methods. It requires a much more higher VRAM GPU. So to summarize, we've covered care. This method requires matched pairs of noisy and clean images. That means we can use it when we have stage fixed samples that are will tolerate being imaged once with bright light, and that will build up our training data set. 
We've also covered noise to noise, which requires pairs of noisy images to train. So that can be used when we have state fixed uh, samples that can't be imaged with bright light. We also covered noise to void, which can handle moving samples since we only have to image things once and doesn't require imaging things with a bright light, but can't handle spatially correlated noise. And then lastly, we covered cost, which can handle mobile samples that uh, are sensitive to light and it can handle spatially correlated noise or at least some cases of spatially correlated noise but requires us to use quite large GPU to train it. Um, and that's it from me. Thank you for listening. I'll now hand over to Chad, who will uh, show some of these methods on real data. Okay. Thank you so much, Ben. That was super nice. Um, and if you're anything like me, after hearing uh, something like that about how these strategies work a little bit, you would be super interested in trying it on some data of your own. So um, now I'd really like to share um, what it's been like um, a little bit to implement these things uh, in at, at SMM and on data that we're generating here in the facility. So just briefly introduce the kind of data that we, we acquire. So here I'm a multimodal electron microscopist in the biological EM team with Aaron as our manager. And um, as part of that role, I generally collect volume EM, um, both SBF, SEM and array tomography data. Um, and we have a Zeiss Sigma, um, we have the GATAN on point backscatter detector and we have the GATAN three view stage that goes inside the chamber. Um, and uh, so I'll just quickly, so we're all on the same page about how we're acquiring this data. For array tomography, it's essentially a resin embedded sample that we are manually sectioning and then um, imaging manually. So with the diamond knife, we're cutting serial arrows of ribbons of sections. It can be up to hundreds of sections and we mount them on a substrate. That substrate could be silicon wafer or a glass slide. And then that we mount in the SEM in high vac mode as a normal sample. And with the backscatter detector, manually image our selected field of view. And we can do that for hundreds of images and build up a 3D stack. And otherwise, we could do this automated using our um, SBF SEM mode. And in that case, we have an ultra microtome with a diamond knife that goes inside the chamber of the SEM. And we take a image of the block face um, with the backscatter detector. The diamond knife cuts a um, small amount off. We take another image and we build up the stack like that automated. But at least in our system, uh, we're obliged to do this imaging in variable pressure mode, which also uh, increases the amount of noise that we get and can de decrease the signal. Um, we also have here at SMM a uh, cell culture facility and as multimodal microscopists, it's part of my role to keep an eye on it. And I also train people in confocal microscopy. And so we have also a lot of users um, here doing plenty of routine live cell time lapses and Z stacks. So we're also producing, of course, a lot of, of volume light microscopy as in every uh, microscopy facility. So we're interested in trying out these strategies that are super interesting for not just saving time because um, that's, that's important. I mean, we'd spend a lot of time imaging, particularly with array tomography. We have to be there taking every image individually. Now I can take days and days sometimes weeks, depending on the size of your data. Um, and we also can have beam sensitive samples that we put in the SPF SEM, so they cannot handle a, a very slow scan speed to increase the signal and so on. And so I think it's clear, as well as having um, sensitive samples for live cell imaging and so on. So I think um, it's not hard to think of uh, a lot of use cases for um, some deep learning denoising. So what's actually involved in the workflow here? What, what do we do? We, first of all, have to choose a model. So as you've heard, Ben has just described a bunch of strategies. Um, and so you need to choose based on your kind of sample and what kind of training data you can acquire, which one is appropriate for you. So ideally, in the best case scenario, you'd be able to achieve match paired 
high uh, signal and noisy uh, images. And you also have to consider if your data is 2D or 3D. 2D uh, models work best on 2D data, but for volume data sets, you'd uh, ideally be looking at a 3D model in theory. Um, then you need to create that training data. So um, uh, you need to create those paired uh, images um, for whichever strategy you're doing. And I'll show you on the next slide exactly how I've done that for some of the experiments. Then you need to train the model. And training the model uh, is going to depend on um, the data type again. And you may optimize some parameters based on the limits of how long you have to train and also the computational resources available to you. And then we should also, of course, evaluate the model. And Ben touched on the loss curves, explained that very nicely. So we can uh, watch the loss curves during the training or just check after the training is done how the loss curves looks and see if the model is preparing, um, performing as we'd hope it would on validation data. And we can report appropriate metrics. So hopefully um, there's some metrics that you can use to try to quantify the uh, quality of your denoising. And I will um, report a couple of those uh, and talk a little bit more about them in a moment. And finally, you're ready to apply it to your data. So ideally, um, Ideally, you will um, be able to apply that model to very similar data um, to what it was trained on with a reasonable amount of confidence. So for the first experiment, what I did and what I will show you is I've done a... Okay, so what I've done is um, an experiment where I took some 3D array tomography data and I have trained both 2D and 3D models for care, noise to noise and noise to void and comparing them um, against one another. So I used a array tomography data set prepared by Jerry in our facility. Um, so here, this slide represents the serial sections um, on the wafer and it's human liver tissue that he prepared with the standard TEM protocol, resin embedded sample and post stained it with lead and neural acetate. And what I've done is selected a field of view in the very first section and taken a single noisy image. And I did this at a two microsecond pixel dwell time. And that would be enough if we took several of those, that would be enough to train a noise to void model because as we just heard from Ben, you only need single images. I, instead of stopping there, I then took a second image immediately after the exact same field of view, but of course it will have new noise, a very uh, a second uh, noisy image, also at a two microsecond pixel dwell time. So these are exactly paired, but have different noise. So this would allow us to train a noise to noise model. And then immediately after that, I also took a 20 microsecond pixel dwell time. So a very high signal image, which can be used as a ground truth. Um, as the training target against noisy one, for example, to train a care model. So I was able to compare them all on the same data set. So here's a, just an example of field of view, low signal, low signal, high signal. And I did the exact same thing at the exact same field of view on the very next section and repeated that for a total of 17 sections. So that allows us to do both 2D and 3D models uh, on this data set. So the very first one to show is, I will show care. So this is with uh, noisy input with a high signal ground truth. And what you're looking at here on the left-hand side, uh, top left-hand side is the noisy one image. And then on the right-hand side, you have the denoising of uh, the 3D care model and the 2D care model underneath that. I think they did a pretty decent job at denoising. And then over here on the left-hand side, I'm just showing you the same area imaged at 20 microseconds. So that you can see uh, in the best case scenario, this is the kind of image that, that we could get, um, you know, for our ground truth, for example. So now here, just to quantify this performance, I'm reporting uh, the PSNR, which is simply the peak signal. It's a ratio of the peak signal to the noise for the image uh, in the It'll be, in this case, um, as a baseline, I'm reporting the noisy input against a ground truth image. So we'd like to um, 
beat these numbers in order to show uh, an effective denoising. And then we're also reporting the structural similarity. So there's a few different uh, inputs that go into calculating that, but it's essentially um, the overall similarity of one image to another. And we can see we definitely improve the PSNR in 3D care and even further by 2D care. And visually, if you really pixel peek this image, you would probably agree that the 2D care image is superior to the 3D, um, which is slightly counterintuitive because you would expect for volume data, a 3D model would be more appropriate. And I will touch back on that um, in a moment. So that's care. What about noise to noise? So in this case, we've trained a noise to noise model um, and looking at the evaluating it on the same area. So we have the same setup, noisy input here, and here's the performance of 3D noise to noise and 2D noise to noise. Um, again, looks nice. It's definitely um, done a good job of denoising. And when we look at the um, output, it's definitely improving the, the image quality here. Um, but still, uh, at least with peak signal to noise ratio, which is probably our preferred metric, 2D care is the, the most superior so far, which is um, probably what you'd expect. Finally, I tried noise to void in both 3D and 2D, and unfortunately, it didn't work. So as you can see here, the output is noisy. So we have a noisy, for both the 3D and the 2D model, it's not any better than our uh, input and the metrics back this up as well. And when I showed this to Ben actually straight away, that was a red flag for him that um, maybe we should check the nature of the noise inherent in these images because they could be structured. Because as um, Ben mentioned, noise to void would not um, perform well on correlated noise. And that's because it has no way, or at least is my understanding, it doesn't have a way to uh, understand that that's not a real structure in the image that it should be trying to retain. Um, so that's something we really didn't expect. Um, and so just to summarize that first experiment, which is the 2D and 3D uh, with the three different strategies, we saw the 2D care produce the greatest peak signal to noise um, and really did quite, quite a decent job. And for area tomography data, what we saw is that the 2D models seem to be superior to three, 2D models were superior to 3D. And that's a bit counterintuitive, but we have somewhat of a working hypothesis. And that is that if you were applying um, 3D or um, care or 3D noise to noise to light microscopy data, so if you think of a Z stack acquired in a confocal, their instrument is optimizing the optical section thickness for Nyquist sampling such that the same point is being sampled multiple times um, over the range of the Z stack. But we don't have that luxury for um, array tomography because we're not uh, sampling in the same way. We're cutting um, real physical slices at 100 nanometers each. So looking at the next slice and the next slice and the next slice to try to help predict the, the signal um, in the slice that you're predicting on, for example, it may not be useful to have that information. And in fact, it might actually confound the model. And also if the registration, as Ben mentioned, the registration has to be perfect for this uh, method. And when you have such large jumps, for example, this area tomography data, it's very standard to do at 100 nanometers, um, which it was image uh, sectioned at 100 nanometers for each section. Um, it makes sense that the registration, it's never going to be pixel perfect because the image is changing too much section to section. So hopefully that explanation makes sense. That's our working hypothesis of why we got the results that we got. And why did noise to void not denoise the image? Um, as Ben um, flagged, it could be that the, the noise was structured. So what I did was something similar to the um, plots that Ben showed about showing the correlation of the noise. This is some. Um, this is an autocorrelation plot that Ben has created the code for. It's in his Jupyter notebooks for running the COST uh, method. Basically, this is just looking at a little patch of noise um, from the array tomography data and looking at is that top left pixel correlated to any of the pixels around it. And this is telling us that actually it is correlated negatively with the pixel next to it. So that could possibly be the, be the reason why noise to void 
was not achieving good results on that data. And just for interest, I took the exact same coordinates of noisy patch from the ground truth 20 microsecond image. So the same section just imaged for longer with the backscatter detector, and we don't see the same correlation. Uh, if anything, there's a slight positive correlation uh, in the X direction. So I think that that's quite interesting and something we didn't expect to see, that we actually have spatially correlated noise, which is changing with the pixel dwell time of our imaging. And so the full implications of what that means for denoising and, and our imaging is something we're still uh, figuring out. But it's an interesting observation. And so with this in mind, I would now like to show um, some SBF, SEM data denoised with these methods, specifically now 2D care and 2D no noise to noise, because the 3D models were not performing as well, and noise to void maybe is not uh, appropriate for this data. So in this slide now, we're moving on to some SBF SEM data, and this is human heart that is provided by our colleagues here. And this was prepared with the classic NC MIR um, SPF SEM protocol. And this is an example of the kind of um, noisy raw data that we are acquiring. And what I did was took just four paired images of this quality here and this quality 40 microsecond scans for the ground truth, just four paired images and trained a 2D care model. And this was the result that we got in the center. So we're able to go from this to this. We recovered a fair amount of data uh, information, I think, in this area. The mitochondria definitely look nicer. And so I um, was quite happy with this. And when we look at those um, metrics there, we can see a huge jump in the peak signal to noise, which you don't need the numbers to show you that it definitely looks like an improved image. I did the same thing, but with noise to noise. So now um, doing this is two paired images um, that look like this, no ground truth like this going into the model. And this was the output. So again, it's definitely improved. Metrics are very similar. Um, and I think uh, it's still a nice image. We didn't get the same level of data or information recovering up here, um, but particularly in the finer points of the cytoplasm and, and so on, I think it does definitely look improved. So then it's all well and good to train these models and see that they look nice testing it on another slice, but what about doing it on a full stack? So what I did was when I finished acquiring these paired four images, I then set up a run overnight using the, the SBF SEM. So on the left-hand side, you're seeing a movie of um, the acquisition, which was, uh, I, I set it up to just run, taking images at two microsecond pixel dwell time. So it takes about 30 seconds for a 4K by 4K image. And I let it run overnight. And when I came back to the lab the next morning, after 15 hours, it had cut a thousand sections. Um, so if you do a fair bit of SPF, SEM, a thousand sections overnight is quite good, but obviously the quality here is, is not great. I had that 2D CAM model that I had trained um, the day before. So the model training just took two hours. And then that next day when the 1000 images were done, I did uh, the prediction of the model on the full 1000 image stack and that took 55 minutes. So it's really not too, too bad. And here is a movie running through uh, uh, the first third of the stack um, denoised with this uh, with this model. So I think definitely we're recovering a lot of information. I was quite happy with the result. And I feel that um, you can really see the time um, that you can get back imaging uh, in this kind of way. So it's, it's, a, it's a potential approach that would be appropriate in some situations for this kind of imaging. So um, then the next example now, we're staying with SBF SEM. In this case, I've used some um, samples that again were acquired by uh, Jerry and his student Zenon. And in collaboration with the University of Vermont, they provided them these archival paraffin embedded human um, pathology samples. And because of theirs, the state of the samples, when they were reprocessed by Zenon and Jerry, they were inherently very low signal, 
high noise when they were put in the SPF SEM because the, the samples were just not of a very high quality. So this was essentially the, the greatest image that we could achieve or that they could achieve. But when we train a noise to void model, we're able to remove a lot of that noise. And I think that it's done, especially when you zoom in at a higher crop, you really see the, the level of noise that's been removed. And it's quite nice because this goes back to the, the advantages that Ben that Ben did mention, which they, we did not acquire paired imaging data for this. These were acquired months and months ago before the model was ever trained. So noise to void, it, it really shines in the fact that you don't need paired data and you can apply it on data that you already have that you may have acquired years ago and was too noisy to do anything with. So I think uh, it's really something that, that that could be considered for your archival data. For my final example, I show an example using COST, which is Ben's um, creation. And in this case, I mentioned the cell culture facility and honest student Izzy O'Connor had cultured these neuron cells and labeled them with mitre tracker deep red. And uh, what I did was go on the confocal and took an image with the resonance scanner um, and an image with the more standard Galvano scanner because I was interested in what kind of noise would we have with a resonance scanner, which might be used for gentle imaging, very fast um, scan speed uh, preservation of the sample. And so I ran the same autocorrelation plots that I showed in the previous slide on a little area of noise away from the signal and, and ran the autocorrelation. And what we saw was that there is a positive, um, there is in fact a positive uh, correlation of noise in the x-axis for the resonance scanner, but the exact same cell, same, I just switched over um, to a different scanner, took the image again, we see that the noise is not necessarily correlated. So in this particular case, the resonance scanner, if you needed to use it, it's a very good candidate for potentially training a COST model. So I trained a COST model on that raw data. And like noise to void, as Ben mentioned, you do not need paired data. So this is trained on the data that you're planning to apply it on. And so on the left-hand side, you see the raw data, very noisy. And on the right-hand side is the restored uh, or denoised version using the COS model that was trained overnight um, and applied the next day. So I think we're definitely recovering a lot of detail. This is live, so you can see mitochondria wriggling around and... Um, yeah, I think it's a really nice use case for this kind of structured noise, um, which it might be worth seeing what kind of noise you have in your in your imaging system. So um, that's all my examples. I just wanted a short word on how I actually implemented it, because maybe you would also like to try it um, on your data. So I use Jupyter Notebooks a lot. Um, for this work. So Jupyter is uh, it's a web-based interactive um, platform. So you can have documents of code written by other people. Luckily, the developers of these methods, they will write Jupyter notebooks with example data and you can just edit them to replace the paths with your own data and, and execute them. And if you don't have access to powerful GPUs, there's a service called Google Colab and it's a hosted service. So you can run Jupyter notebooks with free access to GPUs with Google up to for free. It's I think right now 15 gigabyte RAM GPUs, which is not bad. And if you do want access to up to 40 gigabyte GPUs, you can pay um, a small amount. If that's the only option, that, that's something you can look at. And finally, um, there is a nice Napari plugin for noise to void. So if you like Napari, uh, which I do, um, there's a plugin you can, you can install and use noise to void with a GUI and you can train 2D and 3D models and predict all in the same um, plugin and it works really nicely. Um, and that's what I use for all, I'm pretty sure that's all the noise to void I showed is all done in, in that plugin. So final, final uh, word, which strategy is suitable for my data? I think based on what I've done here, at least in my hands, I would say, if you can generate paired data, care and noise to noise will be the best performing uh, methods. Um, they're really nice, but has that limitation of having to generate that paired data. And noise to void is an excellent option for unstructured noise. And if you can't, if you have unstructured noise and you cannot generate training data, um, it's great. 
And it's also important maybe to check the structure of your noise if, if you don't know, because you could have some surprises as we, as we have. And in that case, uh, a strategy like COS, it would be your best bet, which can also be applied to unstructured noise. It doesn't have to be correlated to use cost. And again, in my hands, I found that 2D models seem to be a simpler and more effective approach for volume EM. And there is a, is a silver lining to that, is, is that uh, 2D models are easier to train. They require less computational resources. They're faster to predict. Um, and you can also more easily generate varied training data because when you're, you're stressing about having a perfect registration, you have to stay in the same area for 3D, but you can, you can make sure that you're getting enough of the training data from the different structures you will have in the data sets you want to predict on. So there, there can be a, a positive in that. So with that, I'm all done. I just want to say thank you so much to Andre and to Aaron, and also, of course, to Ben and to everyone who provided samples for um, these experiments. So thank you very much.